Welcome to episode 14 of Liberty Me's Bourbon and Bitches. You can find this interview and more at our site, bnb.libertyme and bourbonandbitches.com, also on the YouTube channel and our Facebook page. My name is Tiffany Madison, Vice President of Queen Congress Events and co-founder of Creative Destructors. Our lovely co-host, Meg Gilliland, is off tonight creating her new app that is going to change the world, Thousand App. You should check her out on Twitter. She'll be submitting to the Combine in Silicon Valley soon, so she's not sleeping and pretty much doing her thing. So uh, we, we love her and hope that she actually makes in a, a little pop-up appearance tonight. I also am joined by Miss Lucy Sagerwald, our other co-host, the legendary Liberty journalist that writes for Vice and Antiwar.com. She also hosts her own awesome podcast, Politics for People Who Hate Politics. And our awesome guests tonight are Miss Lena Bryce, former writer with PunditHouse.com and Vaughn. Did you see out? Woo, that is not an auspicious <laughs> beginning. Um, and in for Tiffany, Stella. I wish I had Stella. your bio. So. <laughs> Son of a bitch. It does it every time. Okay. Oh, oh my man. lord. Sorry. I was on a flow. Where did, where did I drop <laughs> off last? I think it's cute. Does anybody know? <laughs> Fuck it. We'll begin at the beginning. We'll begin. We were in the yeah. middle of we'll, at, in the middle of that. talking about how yeah, awesome Lucy is. Fantastic. It. So we'll just pick up right there. <laughs> uh, well, Lucy's here with us tonight, and we also have Miss Lena Bryce, former writer with PunditHouse.com and Ron Paul 2012, and current contributor of the Libertarian Republic. She's also a writer at Free Quill and Libertarian Parenting. We also have the awesome Alexander Hendrick, a former combat veteran and consultant with Queen Congress Events, who is joining us tonight, a libertarian trapped in a military town. Little spirit animals over here, fist bumps. Uh, so what are you guys all drinking tonight? Uh, my beer's over there. Stella. I was thinking of sneaking Stella. to get it, so I have to get it. Oh, are you, are you cutting? Coffee. Is that why? <laughs> nice. You know this is this is bourbon and bitches, you know, man. Summer. You gotta yeah. you gotta have it. So what is uh what's our oh, okay touche well, to touche this, so. spring breaks coming up. You at least gotta gotta give yourself some uh, some fun times there. Come on, I love it. Awesome. Well, um, we actually are um, very very interested to all of us to talk about some. Very, very curious topics that are uh, taking place currently. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here is aware of my very sincere dislike and hatred for Lindsey Graham. However, uh, recently he said, or, or quit, I'm sorry, it was a joke, um, that he would use essentially, here's the first thing I would do if I was president. I wouldn't let Congress leave town until we fix this. I would literally use the military to keep them in if I had to. We're not leaving town until we restore these defense cuts. We're not leaving town until we restore the intel cuts. Um, again, he might literally be one of the worst. This guy has said some of the most idiotic statements that have ever come from a politician's mouth. Stuff like, when they say I want a lawyer, you tell them, shut up. You don't get a lawyer. I mean, he's the ultimate grandstanding asshole. I mean, and that was in reference to accused terrorists that are innocent until proven guilty. And, and this is also coming from a lawyer, people. Um, so... Question question to you guys. Oh God, he's he's awful. He's awful. So two questions. One, especially for you, Alex, um, so that the audience is aware, Alex just got out of the military. He was in for eight years. Um, I, I actually have a question very specific to you. If given such an order, do you think that military personnel would actually comply? And then the second question to you guys for us to kind of kick around is, do statements like this actually hopefully damage his chances at any sort of dreams for the presidential candidacy? Or has he already done that by a long career of, of idiocy? Alex, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I think as a, as a whole, the military would, uh, they, they join for the right reasons. To uphold the Constitution of the United States and whatnot, and um, I think as a majority they would not comply. But I think officers, the uh, commissioned, they they seem to be more yes men to their leadership. Uh, but literally had this discussion at work while I was still in, um, and I would ask 
officers. So I was like, if you were given an order to enact martial law or something similar, would you comply? And uh, the majority of, of officers would say yes. Uh, I'd say about about 20% of, uh, of non-commissioned officers would also say yes, but there would be a, a very strong resistance from the, the other 80% of the enlisted personnel. And as far as the actual control for the military personnel, especially in combat units, I think comes majorly from team leaders and squad leaders, because above all, the soldiers or you know the grunt workers that's that's who they follow no matter what so i think as a whole no but i think there would be some so it's a mixed bag essentially yes with with a majority good that's actually that. it's actually reassuring that's actually the same thing my husband is uh, active duty military aviation and he said the same thing when I brought that up to him. I think it would be a very foolhardy mistake of our politicians, especially if it's not in a state of emergency. That's almost the only was almost the only way they could leverage the dissenters against dissent uh, and actually make sure that they don't revolt, essentially, um, in my opinion. And I'm, I'm not even in the military, but I'm around soldiers a lot. And, and obviously, my, my husband said the same thing. So it would be in their best interest to not try to pull bullshit stunts like that, in my opinion. I think it would actually delegitimize de them, even, even though they're not legitimate anyway, but it would delegitimize them further and alienate the military even further from whatever initiatives that they actually would want to, uh, to undertake. Um, do you guys, ladies, have any comments on that? Well, I'm just mentally reminded of Oath Keepers um, and how... I think there are some good and bad things about Oath Keepers and, you know, the whole point of them is law enforcement and military people who basically say, if we're ever asked to do something, you know, if, if Lindsey Graham's joke ever comes ho horrible truth, like, our job is to not do that, our job is to follow the Constitution. And I know that the Oath Keepers have gotten so much shit from people, um, partially because where were you guys before Obama, which has mixed legitimacy, but also because they're seen as being so paranoid for bothering to have an organization about this. I mean, because that's the kind of slur that we we get, um, you know, like, because the idea of them freaks out mostly liberals because it's, it's very paranoid. Um, so I don't know, I'm just thinking about that. I don't know if Alexander has any, um, does he know about the Oath Keepers or what um, do you feel about them? I'm for like I think they're pretty much in line with the three percenters. You ever heard of them? Um, or at least directly related. I think as far as like the, the where were you before Obama statement? Um, I mean yeah, that's that's kind of I don't think that's very relevant. Uh, yeah. If you remember, you know, anybody that was coherent at the time when the 9-11, you know, attacks happened, uh, the nation was in quite an uproar and ready to, like, hey, let's go get them. They didn't really care where the information was coming from, whether it was accurate or not. They were like, someone needs to die. Um, so, you know, that happened, and I think it's going to be a lot, you know, it would be a big difference if it was on U.S. soil versus we're going somewhere else. Um, as far as, you know, is this in line with the Constitution? Am I fulfilling my duty? Am I not? Um, you know, because, you know, that, that, that's a pretty big line in the sand. So. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, I, I think I question those who say, who you were talking about, Alex, uh, who were in the military and said that they would comply and they would follow orders, you know. I question that. I know it's kind of in an um, empirical way because I, I have no back to basis on, but I think that as humans, I, e even if it were my job to follow orders, I would find it very difficult to actually follow through in the actual event. Like, would you be able to shoot down your brother's sister's wife, or, you know, if you had to? Would you be able to, like, gun down 
um, a neighbor. I mean, and and then at the end of the day, you would question what you're fighting for. Like Tiffany said, upholding the Constitution, and if that, if whatever you're fighting for outweighs, the, you know, the Constitution, I don't know that that would actually play out the way, you know. I mean, there's a there's another huge factor is that the military is a collection of mixed peoples from absolutely everywhere. You take a infantry company, you got somebody from damn near anywhere, everywhere in the U.S. You know, so if you're going to instate martial law and move this, you know, infantry company to Arkansas, I guarantee you somebody is going to know somebody there. You know, that's going to be directly related. Yeah. And I think the people that say yes, I would comply are only compliant to a degree because once you know the ones that are going to stand up for the Constitution of the United States and are willing to die for it and or kill for it, you know, I, I don't think uh, <laughs> you know, the promotion or, you know, good boy points don't really count at that point. It's, you know, you get you get the, the guys that don't care and, you know, threatening their life, but I don't think, I don't think they'd make that hmm. decision. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't think that soldiers would do that. I just... I don't. I, as I think about it, I, I, I sort of, as much as we, I, we all, all libertarians probably have dystopian visions in their head if they think too hard about this kind of thing. I think that Americans generally can recognize that Americans are people like me. So, I think that there would at least be a huge percentage of soldiers who, in some dystopian scenario, wouldn't do anything. I just think. The applying that same feeling of human, hey, over there, it just doesn't, it only works with other Americans because that's how it works. Americans are, are people that we don't kill and we don't oppress, but it, it just doesn't seem to apply that way. Yeah, what's interesting to me, what's in, yeah, kind of, yeah, what's interesting yeah, to me yeah, about the I Oath Keepers, with. Lucy, since you brought that up, uh, by the way, Tristan, welcome. We're talking about uh, Lin Senator Lindsey Graham's recent quip, his funny little remark that he would use the United States military to block Congress from leaving until they, uh, to, you know, take care of the defense cut situation. Um, what's interesting to me about the Oath Keepers is, um, you know, when the whole Clive and Bundy thing was going on, I, I love to see conservatives and liberals just totally not back him. But there was a radical fringe, both of individuals that are from the military, that are veterans, and also are individuals that have been police officers or firefighters that are members of the Oath Keepers actually run a campaign to get funded to go and support him. And there's this, this because I, I watched every minute of that live stream. I was totally engaged. I was live tweeting, at, just like Ferguson. I was engaged in what was happening. And what was very, very interesting to me is you had these good old boy ranchers, right, that have been bullied and bullied and bullied by the federal government have the same very, very rebellious mentality as these soldiers and veterans and cops and people that have seen government turn from what they considered at one time to be a, an honorable institution into bullies that have free reign to just crush people. And it was interesting to see those two sides, you know, coalesce and the government stand down. I mean, they literally, I don't know who all watched that live, live stream, but holy shit. I mean, you had a, a former army sniper on a bridge overpass shooting his expertly built $5,000, you know, personal scope rifle at a U.S. federal marshal. And the federal marshals had theirs trained on them and the marshals stood down. I think the Oath Keepers have never, thank God, and I hope it never actually occurs, have had an opportunity to showcase that there are a lot of individuals that have been members of the military and have actually served or, you know, as a public servant that are extremely disillusioned with the entire system. And a lot of it, and it is, it, it is bad PR. Nobody does want another Waco, Lucy, you're right. But it was, it was really good to actually see, for me, I mean, I, maybe it's the Texan in me, but for me, I was like, hell yeah, you don't get to just round up this guy's cattle, kill them, run them down with helicopters because he wouldn't pay your bullshit, basically a monopoly on his land that you systematically use and bullshit reasons to do so in order to just acquire federal land when it didn't really belong 
to you to begin with that belongs to the people who want to use it actually for a productive purpose. But it was great to see, you know, that. And again, a lot of Oath Keepers showed up at Ferguson. They were like, hey, um, we're going to stand watch on these buildings because the cops are standing down. No one's protecting this private property, even though that's their job. So it was it's very interesting. And I, I hope their profile actually gets raised outside of the little crazy, you know, I'm building up my bunker in the basement and storing up my food for the revolution, you know, type of mentality. I hope their profile continues to raise as a rational actor, essentially, when when the shit goes down between the American people and the government. Do you guys agree or is that a, too much of a radical stance? Because <laughs> I like the guys. I do. I don't think it's I, radical at all. No, I think, I, think, I think something like that's very good. You need a, a some kind of physical force, you know, to intervene, whether it be, you know, big enough to make a big difference or, or just... A symbol. It's more of an argument for the Second mm -hmm. Amendment, right? I mean, I think it's good that if you didn't so. have the, if that right to bear arms wasn't really um, upheld, you know, what would we, what would the Oath Keepers defend with, you know? And this is the argument that a lot of, um, I hate to say liberals, but, you know, a lot of uh, gun, you know, law favored people, um, they, uh, they'll say, you know, tyranny from what? Like, what's, what's going to happen, you know? And I think that that probably is a better argument for something like that, where you could show, well, here's where, you know, they came to protect private property, individuals, whatever. Yeah, but I mean, with, you know, many, like the gun registry Sorry, um, attempts, you know, there was, there was massive resistance to those. And, and those were in more liberal states to begin with. Um, and Sorry, I'm using that term, term but uh, more, yeah, gun law, favorable people. There was, there was massive resistance, and that's not, you know, you're not even touching the more extreme base of U.S. citizens. You know, try and take guns away from Texans. I mean, <laughs> give your work cut up. Good luck you. taking their guns. I'm just saying that's a, yeah. I mean. It, and the, I mean, just I mean, thinking about it, you're gonna try and take yeah. guns away from people with guns. What freaks me out about when liberals, <laughs> like, if you argue with a liberal about, like, well, you know, you need gun control because, well, as Homer Simpson said, otherwise the king of England could come and just start pushing you around. Like, okay. do you want that? <laughs> but liberals will respond. Well, sometimes they'll actually say, well, the government's like. What are you going to do against the government? Like, it's huge. And when they respond to that, they're basically admitting the government is so big that if it wanted to completely destroy you, it actually could. But they never seem to notice that they're admitting this. And to get <laughs> full on tinfoil hat here, obviously the government, you know, outguns you, but real warfare, man. And the, um, the government know, like, outguns you because it, it thinks. You know, it's going to have absolute full control over they can its have military and we can't. assets. They can have drones that we can't. Well, right, but say if you want to go hide in the woods and the government wants to get you, you yeah. are good chance that you're screwed. But you know, you have your historical examples like the the brother, the the Belarusian brothers during World War II who basically got a bunch of guns and a bunch of their fellow Jews and said, "We're going to go hide in the woods until this shit's over." So to get total Godwin's law tinfoil hat, like I legitimately think that the government, no government should ever be trusted enough to know who has them or how many of them or basically have any rules over that in case something ridiculous ever happens. I can't disagree with that. <laughs> I don't know. I, hat. I can't hat, disagree with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree. I, I'm uh, quite the radical when it comes to this stuff. I think it is completely ludicrous to even imagine that this federal government, which, you know, arrests people for collecting fucking rainwater on their own property and raids private I property know. over, you know, raw milk is not going to ever use force against its own people, especially when you have this entire elite class and then you have the, you know, sub elite class of this, the elite classes enforcers. Um, 
and, and this actually kind of brings us to another topic a little bit off because we, we want to get to that twat Tom Cotton and what he's doing with uh, trying to revive neocon foreign policy. And I actually wanted to kind of touch on Israel too, but it's very interesting because, you know, everyone was, was really upset about Obama essentially saying that a, a national federal police force would be a great idea because it, there's so much endemic corruption within your local police department. I mean, the fact that some, that the only reason, and, and this is maybe just my perspective and point of view, but I think that the only reason why conservatives didn't like that idea was because it came from Obama. I have always said, beware the blue-eyed, square-jaw Caesar that comes in because conservatives will fall right in line with big government. I don't think they ever would have had a problem with it if it was someone like Dobia, you know, a bumbling idiot, pretend Texan, fake little wrangler, I'm going to go paint my shitty paintings on a yeah, I should be in jail, you know what I mean? That kind of guy could get up and be a freaking conservative hero and propose the same thing, and I think they would fall right in line. Do you guys agree? I, I just don't really see that there would be any resistance if it was a Republican president that proposed the same solution, which is border, it's fascism in a sense. I mean, Jesus Christ, a nationalized police force? That's crazy. I mean, it's called a Gestapo. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, if you want to think about it, we kind of do have multiple nationalized police forces. We have the FBI, the ATF, and they, you know, have greater jurisdiction and control over local police forces. They shut them out of, you know, anything they want, really. And I mean, what what cute name would they call them? You know, the, the really Patriot the Force. That. I mean, what, the, you know, defenders of the, yes, the Freedom Police. The Freedom Police. The Freedom Police <laughs> here to crush your dreams. <laughs> yeah, you're here to I'm just sure doing a freedom free. check here tonight, sir. I just want to make sure you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna check. To make sure your kitchen's free. Yeah, and your bedroom. you need to make sure your make guns sure are free and freedom. locked in your safe with. <laughs> yeah. It's in this lock box. Is there freedom in here? Yeah, check. it's true. It's true. Uh, what do you guys think? You think conservatives would belly up and fold? I really don't know. Uh, you're the you're the resident conservative that. libertarian here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Infiltration, get in there and box them out. But um, yeah, I, like I think I liked your point where like you know it's kind of like who the messenger is, and you know got you know they have to toe the line and you know go. That's that's what makes Rand Paul interesting because he kind of plays a little bit on that side, a little bit on that, and he pisses everybody off. He's pissed off libertarians. He's pissed off conservatives. Nobody knows <laughs> what he is. But, yeah. Um, I think it's good because. I like when people challenge me a little bit and test, you know, my convictions because if, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? So, I mean, yeah. either you believe in limited government or you don't, you know, you can't just say, well, that's a liberal issue and this is a conservative issue. Uh, but I, I think I must, I probably agree more with uh, what you said. Like, I think it's just, if it came from somebody else, I mean, who knows? Like, we could have a, we would have had a totalitarian government by now. You know, I think we kind of do. I feel like we do, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. I, can I, you hear me? Okay, I'm on. I can actually. Uh, we we got I some tinnitus like sufferers apparently that can't hear you. <laughs> 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 I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm joking. He's like, it's probably my bad ears. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, okay, oh, cool. Think, you know, Chris Chris Rogers, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I'm I'm hoping you can hear her because she she makes good points. That's why she's here. <laughs> um. So I try. Tom. I try. Tom. I'm Cotton. no Lucy. I'm no Lucy. <laughs> oh, so we got to move on. And uh, Tom Cotton, man. So this guy is a um combat veteran. Uh, now is a junior senator from Arkansas, and. He is now basically taking up the banner despite the obvious combat and warfare that he's observed in his life and obvious exposure to these completely fruitless wars and the cost, the human toll that's taken not only on the American soldier, but on the population that 
the soldier is tasked with policing or you know uh, waging asymmetrical warfare against despite all of that um he is now in washington and he's the latest punk neocon to splash on the scene and prove in my opinion that republicans are nothing if not wedded to the warmongering rhetoric and military industrial complex profits in an unprecedented move he joined several other senators and wrote a letter about the iranian nuclear talks and how they would fail like this guy is now being lauded by the republican right as the you know kind of the new face and, and this is in short time i mean generally in, in the beltway you know time frame you you are a nothing for a long time until you grease enough palms and i was about to say suck enough dicks but i mean until you actually work your way up the you know political landscape to where you have influence this guy just splashes on the scene with his military record and oh i'm here to tell you all about how we need to continue to go to war and, and do all this i mean Think of all the screw ups that the neoconservatives have inflicted on us for a decade since they seized power. Project of New American Century, all the way forward to basically dominating the Bush II era. You know, now they're, they are a dying ideology that's trying to revive themselves. And now they have a, a new show pony. I mean, and despite neoconservative promises of this you know, limitless ability for America to make remake the world in our image. And for people who are not familiar with this, this founding ideology, two things to recommend. Jack Hunter, just Google what is a neoconservative by Jack Hunter. And I don't care what you think about him personally, he nails it, right? Secondarily, what you should look at is Project for a New American Century Statement of Principles, right? America is the biggest and greatest power of the world and it's our duty to go out and reform the world in the shape of democracy. Well, despite those lofty promises, there are limits to America's military power. Interventionism breeds distress and resentment against the local population. I mean, whether it's Putin or Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya, I mean, literally the failures are like dominoes stacked at their feet. But this guy, despite arrogant leaders that have been proven wrong time and time and time and time and time again, this guy now proves that he's another star rising, another neocon that will not bode well for the survival of Republican foreign policy. I mean, what what is this guy's angle here? Like, does, does anyone, has, have you guys read into like what he actually wants to do? I mean, he's beating the war drums against Iran. Do you want to invade a country three times the size of Iraq that's now folding and destroying itself because of our intervention? I mean, I, I just don't get it. I mean, what are what are your thoughts on his very aggressive stance against Iran? Like, what is the end game here? What is the actual end game with Iran? If diplomacy isn't going to be used, what will? I mean, now that we've lost everybody else, I guess it's just me. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I think the Middle East is. We shouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's I a, a huge conversation. Speak freely. There's no relationship um, here. Yeah. I think we're pretty much done there. I mean, there's we should we should have learned from the last what you know, fourteen years, uh, that, you know, you're you're not going to breathe diplomacy into a nation built up of I mean really like Afghanistan is just built up of tribes and Iraq is completely split via religious preference we have the Kurdish Christian and the Shiite and the Shia Muslims and and they don't interact with each other and the Afghan tribes are you know the same but it's even on a larger scale you're not going to build a Joint government, um, and you're just not going to. It's it's impossible. It's not in their method of thinking. So I mean, and Iran's really no different. I mean, they have a government, but I mean, most of the citizens, it, it might as well not even exist because it has no effect on them whatsoever. I mean, I was in Paktika province, you know, Afghanistan. If any of our viewers have ever been there, I mean, there's there's no government control there's there's not roads you, everything's made out of you know mud bricks i mean what 
their electricity comes from generators and they build or they grow tumble tumbleweeds and that's their that's their cash crop um so <laughs> in iran is just a it's a it's a you know feudal endeavor and they it's not our problem. I mean, if Israel wants to do something about it, I mean, since when has anybody ever been able to tell Israel what they're going to do okay. and not going to do? So, I mean, honestly, just just let them do what they're going to do, and you're just going to have to see what you know hand you're given, whether it's you know whether we provide aid to somebody or not. I mean, Iran's dealing with ISIS already so um i feel like you know that's just a whole situation that just didn't be touched you just let it play out and see what's left afterwards you have no idea and we've already touched it enough exactly. we've exactly. touched it enough and how many times are you going to feel off a scab before you realize like, you need to leave it alone to heal Damn. Right, and like, why is there a wound here? Like, it's the first time I've seen this. No, I've been going like this. Um, but with Iran, though, like, Jesus Christ, people like Lindsey Graham act like the U.S. has never done anything to Iran that would cause them to maybe dislike and distrust us. We fucking overthrew their government and sent them down the road to a theocracy. And we act like storming an embassy is the most tragic thing that has ever happened in human history. Because we are fucking teenage, bitchy, wuss of a nation who does shit and then whines when it comes back and blows up in our faces. And it drives me completely insane. Like, if Iran had overthrown our government, we would have fucking nuked them, like, four <laughs> decades ago. Also, you know, shot down a passenger plane in the 80s because, uh, oh, whoops. Even though it was not even in our airspace. Yeah, I think people forget what we did to that country. And that's so awful because, you know, the subversion and the manipulation. And what's interesting is that, um, it, you know, Bradley Manning, which not everyone's a fan of him, because unlike Snowden, he did do a massive dump of, of diplomatic cables. But what he showed is this intense manipulation scheme amongst these you know, not to use the word privilege loosely, but these privileged Harvard and Yale, you know, douchey kids of bureaucrats that are now put in diplomatic positions that act just as Lucy said, like teenagers on a global inter international scene demanding things. And well, I'm gonna go off and subvert them like teenage girls trying to get your best friend not to like the girl that's interloping in your group type thing, right? Like it's so juvenile and childish. And to actually then bring in the threat of nuclear war, <laughs> I mean, it, I understand that they're waging a proxy war against Russia, but I can't help but remember that hot mic leak between Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin when he's like, hey, just give me until the re-election and I'll have more time. What were you talking about? Like, have more time to what? Show war games over Ukraine or show war games over Iran or to actually make a deal with Iran so that they won't produce a weapon. Like there's so much bullshit going on on the back end that doesn't benefit the people. It's, it's in a game of chess between elites and it's disgusting. I don't really see that there's any benefit to the American people from the nonsense that they manipulate like a puppet strings behind the scene. It's, it's awful. I don't, I don't understand what their end game is. Like, seriously, if, if you think about it this way, right? Like, this fiery rhetoric could easily ignite war fever over Iran's suspected nuclear ambitions. There is no significant intelligence from the CIA or the Mossad. The Mossad has actually, I think they leaked it, honestly, against Netanyahu's, you know, red marker on a paper, you know, like, ridiculous. They, they actually say, hey, we don't have intelligence that fucking supports what this this guy who's just trying to protect his political career and be a strong man is actually saying. Like, if militarists had their way, you know, would a multitude of dead American soldiers, innocent Israelis and Iranians 
be worth the price to delay Iran's unconfirmed nuclear program? Like, I, I just, I don't understand how consistently we allow these people who have failed over and over and over again to dictate any form of our foreign policy or, or even get airtime. I mean, yeah. Because there's no consequences to failing. That's the thing. There's no consequence. There's not even a social consequence. That's the horrific thing. I'm pretty <laughs> soft hearted. I would put Dick Cheney in jail, even though I don't like jail very much. I wouldn't, you know, string him up and torture him for weeks. But there's no, not even a social consequence. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Kissinger, come to this party. Come lecture because you're an expert. There's no consequence to being the most monstrous social engineer at, that, I mean, George Bush in my, I mean, it sounds like I feel like a liberal circa 2004, but George Bush and Dick, Dick Cheney in particular are absolutely covered in the blood of innocent people, you know, and nothing, it's just mm -hmm. a thing to talk about. Nothing will ever happen to them because they did their best. They were politicians. They just did what they were allowed to do. They got to play with their toys. And then when they were done, it was time for Obama to play for a while. And that is how it works. And it's very disturbing. And there's, it's, Talk about perverse incentives. There's no disincentive to stop. I agree. And, and our oversourced you know, military doesn't have the resources to invade and occupy a nation, again, three times the size of Iraq. I mean, engaging Iran in the Gulf would catapult oil prices. It would tank an already fragile you know, world economy. Airstrikes would result in mass casualties of innocent citizens. And the result would be that Arab sentiment toward the West would worsen as the Islamic State is attempting to rise. I mean, another act of brash war would be enacted on another Islamic country. I mean, that would result in homeland retaliation, both in Israel and in the US. Like, if, if US and Israeli intelligence experts do, that are not seeking political ends are quietly whispering under the, the boot neck of bureaucracy that there is time for diplomacy, I mean, rash action and stalling diplomatic talks is nothing but political grandstanding with very potentially sincere consequences, like grave consequences. I mean, I perhaps the solution is a responsible transition from a hostile brinksmanship to a Reaganite, not to use that loosely, but balance of stern diplomacy and robust military defense. Like, this is 2015. It's not 2001. Like the U.S. intelligence agencies are pretty confident that they know that if Iran proceeds with a nuclear weapon, we will understand that in advance. So if the goal is to receive assurances that Iran will not build beyond peaceful use, a diplomacy should be exhausted proactively and vigorously before ever even insinuating the potential likelihood of dropping bombs on Tehran. Like. And how can that be this how can that be accomplished without discussion and negotiation? Like these neocons just bemoan that diplomacy's been exhausted. Bitch, you've been saying that shit for 10 years. It's not the case. Like our embassy housed American diplomats under the Third Reich for nearly a decade. Our nation's leaders opened communication with communist mass murderers, freaking Stalin and Mao. But we can't diplomatically pressure or use any means of resources to negotiate or even communicate with Iran. Like, we can't meet in a neutral location with their world leaders and our world leaders to discuss, to discuss actually thwarting potential global nuclear war. Like, we have learned nothing from Iraq that radicals join terrorist organizations not for religious re reasons, but for financial mo motivations and revenge. Like, what the fuck are you doing? And why are you in a position of influence? It's, it's, very mind-boggling to me. I, I don't get it. And perhaps I never will. I, I don't know. I just... Ah. And, and plus, I mean, an, another scenario is <laughs> crippling another another nation's military in the Middle East, directly <laughs> touching what ISIS already owns. I mean, you're just crippling another government, destroying that military, and then we're not going to be able to stay there forever. So then we're going to leave, and what's going to happen? ISIS is going to take that too, and they're going to just have more revenue from more oil and more natural resources than they already have right now. It's <laughs> you're literally allowing the the cancer to spread, if you will, if you consider you know 
ice is a legitimate threat. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating. So. Oh, by the way, Lucy, yay, Lena's back. Okay. Um, so, Lucy, what do you think their in-game is? I mean, you write about this a lot. You, you are in it. You're an anti-war columnist. Like, what do you actually think about it? Because this does lead into our discussion about Israel, which is uh, the next topic. Well, at the end of the day, like, I can see so easily how people get really conspiratorial about the type of people who just seem to want to go to war nonstop. And, I mean, it's not, it's not bullshit to say that certain people financially benefit from wars. Um, military industrial complex is a real thing. But at the end of the day, there are too many ostensibly well-meaning people who don't, are not going to directly financially benefit from wars, who still always believe we've got to go to war this time. This time, they're so awful. I understand that before, you know, mistakes were made, but this time they're so awful. And I don't know what it is. There's just the magical incantation that is war still holds its effect on people, even libertarian sympathetic people, which says, Sometimes you have to go to war, and when you go to war, theft, murder, enslavement, looting, plundering, torture, all of that doesn't count as the crimes that libertarians or conservatives, sympathetic libertarians, would say that it counts as. War still has this hold over people. That's, that's, it's legitimate, according to people. And if it's legitimate, if it's on the table at all, you know, any time before people are literally at the gates, like fucking Red Dawn, you know, with the paratrooper and Soviets and Wolverines and all that. Like, if you think war is something to consider before that point hits, then it's, you know, always something to consider. And the circumstances when it might be okay are, are more and more, there are more and more of them. I mean, I basically, there's, there's no war I can think of that I think is legitimate, but even somebody who doesn't believe that could try harder to stop war. They just, they're no, too it's good. chicken not to that's go a, to war. That's a good opinion. That's all. Um, I, I, I like talking to my friends that are, that actually live in Tel Aviv that are libertarian, believe it or not. And they are so frustrated with Netanyahu. And the only alternative is almost this leftist nationalist opposition that is seeming to rise up. Um, I can't decide which is worse, a, a right nationalist or a left nationalist in terms of foreign policy. And, and don't get it twisted, APAC, American Israeli Political Activity Committee, Action Committee, it has extreme influence. They really do. And a lot of people don't talk about it because talking about it means you're an anti-Semite. I'm sorry, I grew up in a very integrated place. I I didn't even realize that label was attached to real people. Like. I just don't. It's never been a thing that I've been surrounded by. Like, okay, you hate an individual because of their religion? Like, I don't get it. Like, so that label always falls very flat for me. Like, you're critical of another foreign policy. It's it's really because their foreign policy is awful. That's like saying, oh, you're from France and you don't like George W. Bush, not because he is a mass murderer, a war criminal, should be in jail, but it's because you're anti-American or you hate white people. Like, what? No, I don't like his fucking policies. They're ridiculous. They're ludicrous. Well, a lot of the, the APAC people really push very, very hard for a lot of American influence in Israeli politics. And that influence is very, very warlike because they don't want to be the sole defenders. But Alex made a really, really good point earlier. He's like, you know, if Israel wants to act, they have full capability to do so. They can literally defend their territory. There's no reason to send in Americans to a place, basically like we're your bitch army, to do the dirty work for you when it's consistently backfired on us. If you really want to make an impact, don't choose war. Get to the fucking diplomacy table. Actually do something in the West Bank and in the Middle East that will stop creating this, this awful culture of destruction. And again, if, if McChrystal Mack, uh, for people who aren't aware, uh, General McChrystal, who you know is no longer in his position, made a very, very kind of 
you know, famous, at least for foreign policy people that appreciate his perspective, um, prognostication about blowback, right? And if his theory was correct, he believed that 10 insurgents or militants are spawned from each innocent killed. So if we aren't invading or occupying or attempting to democratize the Arab world by force, you know, would would radicals recruit dissidents so easily? Would people from Denmark and Belgium and England be flocking to the Islamic State? Well, the same thing goes true to Israel. Like, it would be nice to see, and I'll give you an example, um, you know, the moderates is what they're called. They're libertarians in, in Israel that want to see a dismembering of this very radical, theocratic, nationalist state. They cannot and are forbidden to cross the border and take water, medical supplies, you know, kindness to people that are innocent caught in this bullshit between the two sides and their leadership and all that other stuff. They're forbidden by the Israelis from doing so. And it's not because like that one of them got into a, an argument with the border guard and he's like, look, you know, if you go over there and you get snatched, they're going to use you as propaganda and behead you, but we're going to have to come in there and save your ass. And he's like, if that happens, don't. But don't let me cross over here and treat the good people that are caught in the middle of this bullshit. I'm a humanitarian acting on my own. I'll do it myself. You don't have to fucking come save me because I believe there are also good people on the other side of this caught in this conflict just like I am. Let me go prove to them and show them there's human compassion on the other side of this invisible fucking line that we've drawn. Like, I don't, I don't think there's enough of that. And I, I honestly, maybe that means I'm naive, you know, but I honestly think that that's more of what is needed. I'm not talking about the Islamic State people. I'm talking about actual Palestine and Israel relations. Like actually breaking down this, I'm going to draw a fucking line and a red marks a lot on a paper and everyone's going to take me seriously when I have nothing to fucking back that up. And I'm going to use that then to continue this, this total blockade and crushing the Iranian middle class, which only empowers their their country government. Like, it's really an awful situation that, I mean, what is the solution practically? What can we do practically, even in little increments? Is it is it humanitarian, like, relief that changes hearts and minds? Because the bombs and the bullets aren't working. I mean, there's, there's got to be, I'm not trying to get into the middle of, or the end of the, the you know, uh, Middle East peace crisis here, but, but seriously, like, what are some first fucking steps we can take? Anything? Yeah. Withdrawal. <laughs> that's, that's a, good that's a very, very good point. I just, <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, it's not our business. I mean. No, this is Michael. No, Michael. I, I, that is not I can't me. set up Nina, so that, uh, Michael actually had a question, so we're going to bring him on air. Sorry. <laughs> Until I see her camera get set up. So, Hey, Michael. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. Yes, you are. Sorry, Go I'm ahead, Alex. Honest. Sorry. Yes, <laughs> How's it going? But, but just, just like we were, you know, we, we talked about when we agree that, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan are really no longer our business and why are we there, I mean, I can't help but you know, also think that Israel and Palestine are not our business either. If, you know, if, you know, they both want to be dickheads, that's cool. Let them be dickheads. Let it sort out. It's not our problem. So, I mean, that, that's my opinion on it is just leave it alone. They're going to do what they're going to do regardless. Just like, you know, yeah. anything else. It's true. I mean, what has intervention, what has interventionism gotten us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, and, and you know, playing devil's advocate. I mean, like, so whose place is it? Israel in a very knee -jerk You know, how is it? How is it in any of our place to sit? You know, tell Israel that they have to let their citizens go across the border and treat Palestinians. I mean, that's okay. That you know, we think that's fucked up. That's fine. But well, we're not saying that because I mean. We're just, Exactly. Do whatever they want. exactly. Just leave them do their shit. But I mean, I see the point. Yeah, like we're just we're we're subsidizing some of their worst behavior, and we're giving them weapons. Um, I mean, the fact that the same tear gas has in fact 
apparently ended up in Ferguson as it en- has ended up in um in amongst the Palestinians. <laughs> like I mean, I, I don't know. I think that's true. I probably should check on that. But I mean, we we definitely give them a lot of money, and there are a lot of politicians who continue to act like Israel is fundamentally a part of America, like it's Hawaii or something. It's basically part of our lovely 50 states. It's a 51st state, and we need to stop acting like that. Not just because I think Israel is a is bad and it treats the Palestinians poorly, but because we cannot act like that about another country. Not because nationalism is awesome, but because that kind of entangling alliance is incredibly dangerous, and it's already been dangerous for us and for other people. It's absurd to act like their interests are inherently our interests, whatever the hell our interest means. I mean, I, yeah, that that date, you know, that alliance dates, you know, quite a ways back, though. But I mean, you could you could look at it as a possibility that. You know, Mayor America likes to have a military presence pretty much everywhere, and being such a like having Israel rely on us so much militarily kind of gives us somewhat control over that area, and maybe that's why we like to have that connection. You know, it's just they like, like two hundred H bombs. Do they need anything else? Okay, yeah, but you can. That that's a that's a. I honestly, I think that's a stupid argument because we got you know we have enough nukes to destroy the earth. Have we ever used one? Anytime we need to, you know, you're not gonna use but that. They're all saying, I, that, you know, Iran's like, gonna kill us. I, you know, Iran's gonna kill us. Iran's gonna kill us. They can just get rid of Iran in a day. Yeah, but that's you, not you a know real argument. Model will be it, that you if you do that, you know it's exactly what's coming back to you, and it doesn't have to come back from Iran, it's going to come back from Russia or whoever else is going to be backing them that has nuclear power, and there's plenty that do. Um, you, you you just can't do that, you can't use nuclear power anymore without expecting no, I mean, it's, the same it's, thing yeah, back. It's, it's, it's a non-answer. I mean, look at Japan. <laughs> it took two, and that place is still recovering from that. So oh, it wasn't even a two. Yeah. It was two atom bombs, not even two H bombs. Exactly, but that, that's, yeah. but that's my you know it's, that's the point. You can't you can't factor that in to a legitimate defense. Your legitimate I guess, defense is sub nuclear. I, I guess what I'm saying is Iran doesn't have a suicide. You know, they're not that suicidal to go and try and do anything to Israel. Okay. I would agree. I think I I think. They're, they're uh, they very, just, you know, they, yeah, but hold on, it, 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 they have to stand up like they're the strong <laughs> man to their people because they're, especially under our sanctions, their middle class has been crushed. Their merchant class, if you look at their, their actual economic structure, their mm-hmm. merchant class was the thriving economy of Iran. And those merchants are very skeptical. It's, it's a tribal culture, obviously. And they're very skeptical of the mullahs and the the actual individuals that run Iran. So they have to constantly legitimize themselves the same way that Netanyahu has to do in Israel by taking the strong position. They have to fucking bang on drums and no, yeah, I'm the chief. I'm the chief here. I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. And that's their position in order to seem strong. Because in the Middle East, from all of my studies, and from understanding and listening to people who have actually been there and fought in wars there and dealt with the local tribes, the strongest, most cutthroat individual is the guy who rises to the top. So if you're not projecting that strong cutthroat mentality, you're a weak bitch and you'll get overthrown. And that's consistently been proven in the way that they have, you know, basically power structures. So if you don't if you don't position yourself as this oh nine 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 guy, but behind closed doors, they are not in the strongest position. They have two world powers that are fighting over their viability. And they have to pander to us and they have to pander to Russia and they also have to pander to Israel, which they hate. So it's an extremely complicated situation. But but again, there's a very interesting thing like, oh well, you know, they're They said they were going to, you know, destroy Israel. That's been repeated over and over and over and over again. That's been proven to be a misinterpreted and often repeated lie. 
They didn't say that. They don't even have a word for that in their language. What they did say, it will wipe them off the map. That's what it was, wipe them off the map. What they were saying is that Israel should never be relevant, should never have existed. Not we are going to acquire a nuclear weapon and wipe them off the map. Like they are, they are institutionally evil because they suppress their population. They hurt good people. They put people that are bloggers and journalists and homosexuals in jail. They are not a free and just society. These are not people that we should ever be allies with. However, again, what is your fucking in state? Actually occupying? I mean, US national security is essential, but plutocrats talk loosely of war. Well, the consequence of an Iranian conflict would nest disastrous worldwide unintended results. Like this is, you know, the crystal, the bill crystals and the Kagans of the world, you know, are, are crafting wars again for tomorrow's soldiers. They have to endure that endless soul sucking defeat if they ever engage in that conflict. I mean, imperious policies failed in Iraq, they're failing in Afghanistan at great cost. Preemptive war and eternal occupation and nation building are never the fucking answer. We've proven this time and time again. So what is the end state? I, I don't understand like what all the mutual war drum, like is it just a national stage? Or are we just sucking each other's dicks? Like I just don't get it. It, it doesn't make sense to me. And again, I think Lucy's correct. We're, we're run by, you know, a nation of um, childish teenagers positioning themselves as grown men. Yeah, they're idiots. I really I mean, can come up with nothing else but that. Look what <laughs> they're so doing ludicrous. in Ukraine. We finally got By out the way, Michael, war. you joined camera. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. We kind I mean, of we, ranted. <laughs> sorry. We got really entrenched in a, in a good conversation. I apologize. Oh, no. I was trying to figure out. Oh, I hope he's not frozen. No, it's Michael. fine. I just joined Liberty.me, and I was trying to uh, figure things no? out. I didn't mean to join the okay. conversation. Great. Well, poor, Lu uh, poor oh, Lena, she's me? like, we didn't even put on here. And she has 3% Wi-Fi. <laughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? I know. Yeah. Do you can hear me? I can. Wait, Michael, you don't yeah. want to ask us questions? He's here. He's <laughs> no, I, try, I did the way he accepted. I, I was trying to screw around <laughs> with the settings or whatever. So. Uh, Michael, you might want to refresh your, your screen, Sorry. by the way. Goodbye. There you, go. uh, there you go. There you go. He got it. There you go, Michael. Boom! Done, son. I love it. I love it. <laughs> can you hear us now? Yeah, we're good to go. Can you hear me now? I don't know why he's putting me on. <laughs> oh, that sucks. All right. Well, you know, he does. I, he did, actually. That's uh, No, it's okay. It just it sucks. Either that or we're just loud and intimidating and amazing. So, yeah. Um, does anybody else have a question? Because otherwise we are probably going to wrap up. Um, no after party this week. I'm sorry. And by the way, if you do have a question, just request to come on camera or actually pose your question in the uh, chat there. It's um, on the bottom portion. Free for all, no censorship. Get it done. Um, otherwise, we will, yeah, now, Lucy said, now, damn it, now. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, wait, Lena, I think, might be able to get on for a nice little sign-off. Uh, no after party this week. My husband and I are actually taking a trip, and I have to pack. He's a little busy bee running around the house right now. So uh, I have to uh, make sure that shit gets done. Oh, after party at Liberty Me Chat. Very nice. Good call, Ken. I like it. I like it. No, Lori, there is no FCC approval here. We are good to go. <laughs> awesome. All right, great. Well, we're actually at our time, and we promise we're at 59, so I think we're good. We literally were like, do not go over an hour. <laughs> it was good. Yes. But look, a question. Oh, all right, all right, all right. We'll do it. I, I, oh, and it's Frank. I mean, come on. It's freaking Frank. We have to answer his question. He's the best. Okay. Uh, Frank asks, I, how can I'm we know it. anything about foreign policy <laughs> when it is governed by secret agencies like the CIA, etc.? Interesting. I have my answer. You guys go. Uh, who, who, 
who, oh, me, did I say anything? Okay, something I find amazing is that, like, usually conservatives, basically, let's say hawks, they act like we should all trust the CIA. I mean, they want to keep the NSA spying on all of us. Yet, at the same time, they don't believe in blowback, which basically is a CIA term. And when the CIA issues reports about how, gee, funding foreign, you know, uh, training foreign troops, you know, Contras, etc., doesn't really work, and they ignore those conclusions as well. They, I mean, they, they don't even listen to the experts that they profess to believe in when those experts come to any important conclusion. Um, how can we know? Don't trust them. Just don't trust anybody. Don't come to any imat, you know, con paranoid conclusions that you can't prove just because it's scary, but a general distrust of the military, the CIA, the NSA, I advocate for that. Just presume the, the worst, even if well-meaning people. It's just, uh, don't trust them. I mean, Go, Alex. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you can actively see foreign policy. Unfold. You can actively see foreign policy unfold. Like nowadays, it, there's there's so many methods of exchanging information. Uh, I mean, you, you have soldiers fighting a war that also have access to mm -hmm. Facebook at the same time. Uh, so you you know you can actively you know get feedback from what is happening worldwide, and you have you know civilians from damn near every country besides like North Korea have access to some form of social media and you can get direct, honest, and candid information from what exactly is happening. So I mean everybody just no, we're here. quiet, I can't hear anything. No, that's anymore. good. Continue. Continue with that. I mean, do you, uh, Alex, okay. do you trust the CIA right. being in the military um, and working very closely with, you know, obviously counterinsurgency methods, a lot of the intelligence obviously comes from military intelligence, but the higher level is, you know, CIA. Um, maybe you should explain a little bit more of what you did, and then I'd love to hear your actual opinion on the CIA. I mean, honestly, I've... I've I mean, I've never encountered anything directly with the CIA. Obviously, I've I've operated off of the information gotten from military intelligence, and honestly, military intelligence is probably the most inefficient system I've ever seen. Um, I mean, we've we've gone to raid you know raid houses, and literally our uh, our satellite imagery it was from Google or Google Earth, so. <laughs> You know, it's some of those buildings weren't even existent. They didn't even exist anymore. They weren't there. Um, so I don't know how efficient the CIA is or what exactly they do. Obviously, it's supposed to be um, confidential. And and right. I mean, what do they do? We don't. We never know. I mean, until after the fact, and then it's like you know. Declassified. I, and you know I'm, the I'm willing to bet their their primary purpose is, their purpose is confidential transfer of funds, people, and materials. I don't see them having much bigger of an impact than than doing those three things. Um, yeah, that's good though. That's fair enough. And yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that you say military intelligence is very inefficient. It because that's a consistent piece of feedback that I hear from countless people that are involved in actually having to deal with military it intelligence. Is, it's, it's, it's awful. So, so it's absolutely well, it's absolutely ridiculous. Because I am okay. Like I was, I was infantryman, right? They literally, we're out there. We are gathering intelligence while we are out there based on our patrol or raid or whatever we did. And we feed that back to military military intelligence. They try and piece together all these pieces from all these different regions and, you know, try and tell us what's going on in our area. They're getting intelligence real time from us. We know what's going on in our area. And the, 
Do they it's, shot it down or do they just disregard it as inefficient or not as superior to what they are using from Google fucking Earth? I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, we're we're we we're given our tests and our tests come down a long chain of superiors and then we're going to operate off those tasks but obviously it's very fluid we're given a task we have a plan that plan never actually happens and we just you know it, it's in an occupational war it's, you're you're going to be very reactive more than proactive because you don't have a designated force you're going to, you know it's just you're just going to have that's why Alex left the military and he's out two days now Woo! cheers cheers <laughs> 14, technically. 14. 14. 14. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, I'm the I'm, I'm like, fuck this yeah. shit. I'm done. <laughs> you bitches. <laughs> awesome. That's great. So I, I guess that does, you know, beg the question that Frank <laughs> asked, which was a very, you know, astute question. Can, do we know anything about foreign policy when it is governed by secret agencies like the CIA? I don't think it's governed. Um, I don't think... The CIA, which is a proven institution of failure and liars, despite, I'm sure, many secret successes that they've had, actually govern foreign policy. They are advisors. They're an advisor institution. They do a lot of shit off the scenes that we will probably never fucking learn about. However, they are not the end-all, be-all consultants. You have to have multiple voices and multiple systems of intelligence. And if, if any of you guys actually watched, and if you haven't watched this, I highly recommend it. Citizen for the documentary about the first days of Edward Snowden defecting, essentially, from the National Security Administration. There's a reason why the NSA and the FBI and the CIA all hate each other, because the NS NSA has the top tools, right? They have a massive infrastructure of spying on every single one of us. I'm sure they're listening to this right now, and I give zero fucks. You have to understand that there is competition between these agencies for <laughs> points and medals and accolades and you know hat tips and bullets on your fucking resume right so they're competing with each other behind closed doors that competition actually does kind of weed out inefficiency it should be more and it's not it's an awful system but at least there's that element there where they're ego versus ego versus ego are actually contributing to the knowledge that is drafted. The problem is Washington and the national security apparatus. It's it's a, in a whole problem. The beauty of all of this is that we, I think, as systems continue to fail and decay, can break free from this system dependent on secret knowledge. And your privacy is dead. We don't have privacy. Everything on this phone right here, I say, as a guarded discussion. I don't see anything I wouldn't say unless we are face to face. And when I'm super in revolutionary conversations. Yeah, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't I don't think I shouldn't anything. say on the phone. Oh Jesus. Yeah, Christ. I I I, 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 well, I know well, I they've erected, well they've erected a system I'm like the same where they can just go back things. ten years from now. You know they what? can read so, every fucking thing I wrote. And that's okay. I go balls to the wall. Yeah. Don't be wrong. I mean, shit, the internet lives forever. I'm over here saying, you know, awful things. However, uh huh. And that is, and, and the documentarian that made me, uh, Citizen Four, <laughs> Laura, Laura Poitras, she has been detained trying to leave the country to actually do her journalist work and duties by the TSA and border police. For her work, exposing war crimes and exposing awful, awful things that took place in Iraq and in Afghanistan as an active filmmaker and documentarian. So to think that it won't happen to you, it could it, in, at any time. There, it, there are no rules anymore. There aren't. And that's very important for all of us to remember. There are no rules. And especially as the state continues to grow and then decline and decay. That's what you have to think about. I mean, the, the okay. state will decline and decay. What do states that decline and decay always do? Protect themselves first. 
And and so I'm very guarded. They get worse. You know, when I want yeah, to partake in illegal substances. <laughs> we have euphemisms for that. We don't say it on yeah, you got it. You really have to make sure that you're never, um, protecting your that. technological uh, footprint, in my opinion. Now, with that being said, I'll say whatever the fuck I want. However, when it comes to actually being illegal, um, Edward Snowden was right. Knowing that you're being guarded and, or I'm sorry, uh, observed makes you guarded. And it, it does censor speech. It does censor communication between free people. And that's the awful situation that comes out of it. So whether you can trust um, the foreign policy from the CIA, I mean, no, because they're just as guarded interdepartmentally <laughs> as we are with their with their actual intelligence. However, I will say one thing. Um, there are a couple of veterans that I know that actually work for these alphabet agencies that are very good people. Um, they're very good people and they are um, very dedicated without saying too much <laughs> to actually, you know, they, but they're, mm, yeah, it doesn't I would matter say more to validate people. their goodness, yeah. but um, there are people inside that also do not like the trends that are taking place and they do not like the corruption of an agency, which in the cold war era was actually doing some good shit, right? Like there are people in there that have the capacity and the power to do no. some takedowns on the inside. So never forget that those people exist, just like they did with the contractors at NSA and Edward Snowden. He was a rare, a rare breed. Yes, they did. <laughs> they did make a good Hold on, high school dropout. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Was an excellent choice. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, some head hunter. Man, Please. good choice. All buddy. day long. Kyle anyway, um, before we wrap up, have Please. you guys actually yeah. watched that documentary? What'd you think about it? Did you watch it? Okay. Well, if you need an HBO login, lady, no, but I want to. Holla at me. I'll give it to you. Yeah, it's that's really on my list good. for this weekend. It's very compelling. It's not one of those that you can watch. <laughs> yeah, it's not one of those things that you can watch while you're that's doing other things, like the body language. The eye contact, the very raw discussions that were taking place between people who knew that they would be in the crosshairs of the most powerful government in the history of the world was pretty amazing. It was it was very good. I always had a fan crush on Glenn Greenwald, even though I disagree with him on a couple of things. Like I, he's pretty much a hero to me. It was a very compelling film and a, an amazing documentary. I would encourage everyone to watch it. Citizen Four is what it's called. And I'm sure you can get it online, too. So I would definitely highly recommend uh, anybody watching it. I think... Like dresser. Laura, what's her name, was had it online. Yes. You what? Free, but um, one would have to Google that. Yes. It has to be. I think she, yeah. she had but it's it nice to see it somewhere. on HBO. That's a feature Maybe channel. You know, it's a feature channel. It is so that's pretty good. And that it won, I guess, an Academy Award. Not that yeah. shit yeah. about that. But it's nice to see liberal Hollywood actually, um, you know, abandon their god of of uh, liberalism and understand that he was full of shit from the beginning. So anyway. All right, guys, we have to wrap up. We, we went 13 minutes past, but not 60. So that's yeah, good. <laughs> uh, last time there was, uh, it was a really good, uh, <laughs> fruitful affair. And you went a little long. Thank you so much, Frank, for posting that link. Everybody, when we conclude this uh, cast, this entire chat will go away. So make sure that you grab the videoneat.com documentary that Frank just posted. Watch it. I cannot recommend it enough. It's very compelling. It's pretty amazing. And it's raw and unfiltered. It's literally, I'm setting up a camera. We're going to interview you. This person who's been crypto contacting us and dumping some of the most disruptive files that have ever taken place in American history on your laptop. And here's how we're going to secure it. Here's how we're going to navigate this. It was amazing. And it was a lot of fear and a lot of concern for his safety, their safety. Um, it's gross to to understand the, the far reaching tentacles of, of the United States government. So anyway. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is concluding episode 14 of Bourbon and Bitches. Thank you so much, my awesome co-host Lucy. Thank you, Lena, for participating. And thank you, Alex, for being fantastic. Everybody have a great night. Sorry there's no after party, but maybe next time. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, you can watch this awesome podcast slash webcast on uh, bnb.liberty.me and also on the YouTube channel and bourbonandbitches.com. You can also follow us on Facebook. And don't forget to follow Meg Gilliland and her amazing app that is going to be submitted to the Combine. And it's going to knock it out of the park on Twitter because it's pretty amazing. Sign up to be a beta tester because she is got something good. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, have a great night and cheers. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Cheers.